Welcome everyone to the Contact Center Perspectives podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host, and we have a fascinating conversation today with Candace Wallace, the Chief Customer Officer at Reliance. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to expand a little bit more on who you are, but I'm going to throw out a tidbit right after I say that what we're going to talk about here is why advocate for downward CSAT trends? In fact, why advocate for some of the key metrics that we know that we rely on, we report on, the board looks at to go the opposite direction. Why would we want to do that? But before we get into that, you have an interesting part of your background that actually ties directly into what we're going to be talking about here today. You are a former archaeologist. That's right, Steve. It's always my fun fact at any event. It's helpful for folks sometimes to understand that you can switch careers at any time and, and bring skill sets with you along the journey, even though they seem miles apart. But for me, one of the things that was always fascinating in the world of archaeology that's really fascinating still in the world of software as a service is just the data, like the information. And so I think that's probably, I am a data-driven person. So when I think about something like a contact center, we live and breathe data every single day. And in my world as an archaeologist, it was the same thing. How do you look at thousands or millions of data points to really tell a story and understand what's happening? Even sometimes the absence of information becoming a major driver for an insight around what you're looking at. But I would say that's a little bit of a passion that's going to probably help me find my way in different places, moving from archaeology into the software world. I'm glad you've given us that little bit of insight because now I know that archaeology isn't just like Indiana Jones. We want to start unpacking because this is reframing the conversation in a very important way. Because lots of times what happens in a contact center and funding for a contact center are based on how we're doing, how we're hitting these key metrics. But let's just step back for just a second. And you wanted to talk about a plan to grow and what that looks like. And as you're scaling, what does that mean for the team? And then that's going to segue into our conversation about then how we track metrics. But once we've established at the foundational level what's important here. How do you think about the plan to scale and, and the team to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I think these are all things that we're all talking about. One of the most important things for scale for a contact center is really self-service and leveraging different technologies to really help meet your customers where they are giving them insights and information real time when they need it in the channel that they want. It's all the things that really drive us day to day. One of the things that's really important when we talk about this is I always say like, when you're trying to scale and grow your business, one of the most important things you have to do is put the customer at the center of that. So doing the things that are sometimes painful, like journey mapping and really analyzing all of your data, but understanding your customer journey across your full universe is really important. And so when we think about how we scale, it's important that you understand how they engage with you across the pre-sales function, how they engage with sales and customer success teams and service teams, because holistically what the customers are looking for come across quite a few different teams and in a lot of businesses, a few different P&Ls as well. And so when you think about budgets and how folks are focused on that, if you don't holistically look at it, you're not going to get the great impacts that you're looking for when you're really trying to drive down those interactions and get people to leverage those types of resources. And so for me, I always ask people to take a step back and say, look across your peer sets and really understand how we look at that holistic customer journey, because that's really the foundation to make impacts inside of your contact center. This idea of self-service, and it's powered a lot by AI, and it's all the rave, it's all the trend. We're racing in to do it because we know everybody else is first and foremost. You've got to be very critical before you just jump on the bandwagon and how you think about that. Tell us a little bit about how you're approaching this and helping to lead your team. When you think about what you're trying to do in a world of self-service, the buzzword is a lot of times personalization. And it's not just a buzzword. It's what people expect. The foundation of being able to personalize an experience for folks is really understanding it. A lot of times when people make mistakes, when they start to think about where they go, is they start building self-service pathways based on what they think they know about their customers. So if I can leave you with some really important information in this space is you do know a lot about your customers. And that's the best place to start the investigation but it's really just the tipping point. So a lot of times when we think about self-service in a contact center, you have a lot of data already of 
why people call when you look at your case types. What are the types of items that really drive average handle time or drive lower customer satisfaction? There's a lot of things that you know, but it's also really important to take a look at the behavioral data. There's sometimes what our customers tell us and what they do are pretty different. So how can you understand how they're engaging across your universe? And you could never really do too much market research when you think about understanding this information. So a lot of times what I say to folks is take what you think and then figure out how you can go out and get some interviews on the ground, understanding end users and what they're trying to do. And then you're going to validate that with things like surveys, where you're really going out and understanding all of these hypotheses that I had, these things that I thought customers wanted. How do they actually feel about that? When we first started our journey at Relias to take a look at some of this, we really took a look at all the things that we thought we knew. And then we said, okay, how can we prove this information to be correct? And that was really where we started and let the customers tell us that and allow us to really focus in on unique customer segments, unique personas, and really understand what they wanted from us. And that really helped us start that personalization process by taking what we knew and what we validated when we went and engaged with the marketplace. You brought up data before. One of the biggest validation, and that data is telling us so much about that. And you have all kinds of things. You have all kinds of in-app experiences and all kinds of things that, that inform data, how they're using the bots. So I want to talk about the expectations that head in the opposite direction and why. You, know, you brought up average handle time. You brought up CSAT, this first-time resolution. Why? Should we even be talking about what we hold true, what we report up to the board, that it's going in the wrong direction? Why would yeah. that happen and why is it with that? It's sometimes like when you've gone through it, it feels a little common sense because there's an expectation that you hold the same standards that you've always held. We should always be getting better. But if you don't have a really solid structured self-service environment, if you're not heavily using things like bots, you really have to step back and think about what type of traffic is this deflecting? One of the ways we took a look at that within our own business is we said, okay, what are our case issue types? And classifying them across different tiers of case types and their levels of complexity. And then we start looking at what are the trends at that issue type level? For example, if I have something that's wildly complex, if you really dive down in the layers of that, you're already going to find out that the types of things that you are likely going to self-service are going to be the ones that have the highest satisfaction. They're going to be the easiest to resolve, highest first-time resolution rates, lowest handle time. And those are your items that are just like ripe for the picking of what can you go through and drive through self-service. And then when you look at what's left, some of the things you need to understand is what does satisfaction look like already when people are coming in and talking about the complex? And I know within my own universe, those complex items were the ones that had lower CSAT, they had higher handle time, they had much lower first-time resolution, and kind of the list of metrics go on. So we knew analyzing our own data saying, okay, when we eliminate these items through our different self-service channels, we can expect that average is actually going to go down. Now, we're not crazy. We do still have targets on some of these things. So it's really important that when you're out there, you're also looking at industry benchmarks as well as your own data. You need to be above a level of good. That's always a target that you have. But as you start to look at some of these things, the, the other types of data that you're now going to measure is going to be customer satisfaction on self-service. And the industry trends on that are lower than when you're actually engaging with an agent. And so you have to set targets based on benchmark and best practice, and you have to categorize it across a much broader universe for those types of things. And is there a component that pushes things in the opposite direction that we normally want to go as well in terms of the things that are harder to handle, the ones that are going to have a require a live agent? Sometimes we want to have the agent spend more time because changing a negative into a positive. That's what helps with loyalty. That's what helps with net promoter scores. The thing that drives throughout the industry that contact centers are cost centers. Let's reduce the cost. This is an overhead. This is one of the biggest overhead expenses in our organization. So obviously it's an area you want to reduce costs. So everybody loves self-service as a result of that. But the contact center in how we handle frontline customers, talk to us a little bit about how that directly impacts in the positive way on those kind of meteor, those heavier, those harder to resolve things, if we spend a little bit of time, how does that actually benefit 
those revenue benefits are always your lagging numbers. It's net retention rate, gross retention rate, renewal rates, even net promoter score can be pretty lagging when you think about trying to look at some of your trends. When we started our process of saying, okay, what do we need to know about our customers to drive a really valuable self-service experience? And which channels do we want to leverage? So those different technologies. And when we think about our customer segments, we knew that we had room for improvement and some of those lagging indicators already. And we had a hypothesis coming into it that if we can create a highly valuable digital experience for these customers, not only would it drive down some of those costs but because we are handling some of that self-service, but we could see those results in the longer term view. And I am very happy to share that when you have a robust self-service, we saw those trends go in the right way. And those are the ones your boards really care about. So driving improvements in net retention rate and very specific customer segments that you're targeting, the net promoter score always leads a little bit ahead of that net retention rate but still pretty lagging, similar feedback, really seeing that drive up in a meaningful way. And the only way you can really measure and tie those results back is if you get your data pretty granular. So no longer do I care about performance just across my business, but I care about it at specific customer segment levels, market segments, and really being able to slice and dice so that when I do a digital experience, I can measure the results real time. So there are those things that are leading, which is how they're adopting and engaging with some of those items, which are real-time measurement. There's the volume reductions that happen on the contact center side that you can measure real time as well. And then you see those other lagging items follow that trend and that journey. But you have to be watching across all layers to really make sure that if you need to pivot, that you can. And we've certainly had to do that at different times throughout our experience, but they all tie together. Everything you said made great sense there. But one of the things is that we tend to report up, not on granular, we tend to report up and then drive decision making based on overall, what's our overall CSAT score? What's our overall net promoter score? What are the overall average handle times and how are we handling that? But if you don't break it down into these individual segments that you're talking about, and not every segment of customer is equal to every other segment as well in terms of impact on the business. And maybe that's your background in archaeology, a love of data that's coming into play here because inside of the data is information that is knowledge that can be acted upon. So what you're articulating here is just a much more deep dive in visibility into the leading indicators that should drive the business. And I think that's a big takeaway for everybody here. But what this also focuses on is that there needs to be this balance of self-service and live agents. What is your perspective on, are we going to need live agents in the future? The reality is you're always going to need, there are quite a few places where I've had some personal experience in our own company where we experiment with technology and even AI in some places. And the reality is you always need a person to help validate, to guide, to engage, to coach, even with the world's best large language model. There's so much more value in lived experience and how someone can engage and drive one of these things. So I don't see it going away. I do think it's highly impactful because what we're doing is we are removing kind of low complexity elements out of our universe with tools like this, where what's left for us is things that are more complex that maybe any kind of model wouldn't have enough insights on. The other thing is that you're also leveraging AI and technology to help you simplify the complex as you're working directly with the customer. So you can leverage it in a handful of different ways. But the reality is there's always this importance of needing someone to be there to engage because we're humans and we like engaging with other humans, but also to man the technology. And so as you evolve and your universe evolves as a contact center, the reality is across all of our digital self-service channels, whether that's in-app, a community, email campaigns, bots, there are people across our teams whose jobs are now to manage and massage and manipulate and help these tools be really effective, which means you're watching data real time, you're correcting real time, and those are new skill sets for your staff and your team members. And the other thing to keep in mind is while maybe overall volume and cost can go down, your average spend may go up when you think about per agent, because the reality is when you move the kind of low complexity items off, all that's left is highly complex, which means you probably need more complex skill sets and competencies than what you've had before. And so you will have directional reduction in some of your operating costs, but it's not a one-for-one -one because you're leaving a more complex universe, which requires 
specialized skills. That's really important for folks. I hear that a lot sometimes when people are like, oh, AI is going to drive a 25% reduction in my volume. I'm going to save 25% of my operating costs. That's not going to happen. There's other trade-offs. You're still going to get it down, but it's not going to be a one-for-one. So you have to keep that in mind. Maintaining and managing costs is critically important, but the focus has to be on if this isn't creating a better customer experience overall, then we're going in the wrong direction no matter what's happening with costs. And where I think you're going on this is that with this kind of evolving role of the live agent and the complexity that they're handling, there's a lot more that we're going to require of these agents to do on a regular basis of the cases that they're addressing. How do things like company culture or the experience of the actual agent themselves, and how do you think about that in terms of like their satisfaction level. We spend a lot of time thinking about customer satisfaction, but how do we think of the agent experience and their satisfaction level? How does that rise in importance and what's your thinking on that? It's equal importance. Imagine that if you had like the worst day in the world and your entire job was to talk to people, how bad it would be, how that would come across in a phone call. Like everyone that's human, it's hard to separate those two things. And so that employee culture piece is really important. I think within our business, we put just as much equal weight. And even when we think about our company OKRs or objectives and key results, we have a high focus on elements related to culture. So we're measuring things like employee net promoter score. We're measuring things related to your employee engagement index. So do our employees feel engaged, that they have room for professional development and growth within the business? And we also look at things like what we call a manager empowerment index as well, which is really a handful of types of questions where we're making sure that our managers are effective at helping develop our frontline team members as well. And so you have to have that balance because if your team members aren't happy and feeling like that they're growing, it's going to be really hard for them to deliver an exceptional customer experience and to grow with you the way you need them to grow with you. So you have to do both. It has to be equal weighting. You just dropped another major reframing <laughs> point of view on us because everybody's going to talk for the board level on about customer satisfaction. Nobody talks at the board level about experience, agent satisfaction. But you just said these are two things that are as important and you explained exactly why. That makes perfect sense. That then talks about, I lightly touched on the conversation about then company culture and how that impacts the agent and therefore the customer. I wouldn't say that over the dawn of time that company culture has been something that like the chief customer officer or chief experience officer would been, have been very focused on, but it sounds like that's an expanded area of real importance that you're focusing on today. I would definitely say that. And the reality is whatever CXO you are, I think that if employee culture is not part of what you consider to be a key responsibility, you want to drive an engaged workforce. That comes with transparency. It comes with communication. It comes with room for opportunity and growth. No one goes into a job not wanting to learn more and to grow their career with you. And one of the great benefits of really having a great self-service focus is that it adds career pathing and growth and development for the folks within your contact center as well. And so we are thinking about and constantly evolving, okay, as our universe changes, how do we take a look at our competency matrix and the skills that we require? Where do we need more role differentiation because of what's left and what folks are doing? You have to be constantly watching and evolving, ensuring that yes, while you're evolving the needs of the customer, or you're evolving the universe of your employees along with it. Because I think inside of our support team here at Relias, we're very proud of the fact that most of our turnover is promotions out into other roles across the business. And so that is something that we really, it, it's just built into how we operate. We know we need trainers regularly to help us bring chucks on and onboard them and help them be effective because we're going to grow them into something that others in the business want. And you have to understand where people are going, what you can do, and you just have to own it to help them be successful. And it's going to help you be successful as well. I was actually talking to a CRO and CMO, and they attributed 50% of the success of the company. And the CRO has sales underneath them. 50% to the culture inside of their company. 50% of their success, they attributed to the culture. So I love what you're saying there. You also talked about reducing agent turnover, giving them career paths and things. Agent turnover is one of those problems I classify as it's been such a problem for so long at such a high level that we just kind of learned to live with it. 
Because we've talked a lot now about the importance of the agent in handling the cases that are much meatier and more complex. If I was to say on a scale of one to 10, how important is agent turnover to the overall success of the business, the vitality and the growth of the business? One, it's not important at all. 10, it's vital to the overall growth and success of the business. How would you rate that on that scale? I'd be up there in that eight to 10 range. And I think it's not just agents, it's everyone in your business. And the reality is we have a constantly evolving and changing workforce across any company that's out there. The folks that join your business day to day, your people are your culture. Sometimes the word culture can be a bit of a loaded term because who are you trying to define people? Or are you only looking for certain types of the people? The reality is I want people who work hard, who communicate well, who have passion for what they do. But the culture that we create, it's created by our teams and every level of turnover, every level of growth, the new roles that you have, your culture is constantly evolving and changing. You have control over your workplace environment and how you want that to operate, but the culture of your business and your people, and you bring in new people every day. And so that's why it's really important to do things like regularly survey and do things like skip levels and engage across the business because you're always going to be off the mark. You're going to constantly be taking feedback and adjusting how you operate. But the reality is your workforce changes year over year, sometimes quarter over quarter. And so it's your job as a leader to be listening to your people and really consistently finding ways to improve because it's changing. It's always evolving. So you're never going to be 100% on point and that's okay. Your job is to get as close to it as you can by constant evolution. And I think that's really important for folks to recognize because even something like motivation styles, how people like to work, the schedules that they're looking for, it changes constantly. If I were to try to run our teams based on what people wanted or how they operated from even three years ago, it would be wrong because that's not what folks want nowadays. And I think sometimes you have to stop trying to push people to where you need them to be and start understanding where the workforce is going and how you can evolve with it. I'm glad that you mentioned that it's everybody in the company, but at the same time, the agents, they're your front line. Mm -hmm. They're the interface with the customer. And that's why you put customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, but agent satisfaction really at at an equal level. The turnover is, is definitely not something that we want. And I think everything that you're doing and working on that experience that they have and the the career paths and everything can take over and help that. The fact that you're actually also upgrading or changing or evolving the kind of agent, how is that going to address or impact agent turnover? Because you're going to be looking for a different profile, really. We have a responsibility on both levels of this. If I am adjusting competencies real time based on what the business needs are. I have a responsibility to upskill the staff that I have, which is your job to do that. And then I also have to take a look at, as I'm hiring, how am I able to evaluate and bring folks in with those different skills? You also have to be, anytime you change the skills and competencies of your staff, you have to keep an eye toward salary ranges and benchmark in the industry and other pieces, because as these things change, all the other pieces trickle along that come out of that. There are certain elements where all of a sudden now I am looking for different types of skills. At a foundation, there's a lot of things that we always want that we're still going to want for the rest of time. But there are more technical skills or expertise that you may be looking to bring in as you grow and transform your teams. And so it's really important to stay close to that data. Once again, there it is. But looking at what's all of the information about what customers need from you, telling you about what you need from your teams. And then it's your job to be able to sit down and come up with development plans and other programs to help folks evolve as that takes place. And to really think about if you're going to work with this type of customer on this type of technology, what are the skills and competencies required uniquely for you in this environment? Elements of specialization become really important. I think a lot of contact centers do really great jobs with skills-based routing and really evaluating certain types of folks to work on certain types of cases, but that's going to shift as well over time. And you just have to constantly be watching and changing along the way. The whole goal here is why? Why are we advocating for downward CSAT scores? Why are we advocating for things that are taking metrics in the wrong direction? What has typically been the wrong direction? What is the single most important takeaway that you want people to have from everything that we've talked about here? I think the reality is it's that you're Meeting your customer base where they want you to be. And that's what's really important. In a world that is highly digital, 
people want the right information in the smallest bite-sized amount that they can get it at the right time. And when that's not enough, they want a direct pathway and escalation to a human being that can just help them solve the complexity of that. The most important thing you can remember is that you're doing these things because it's what your customers are looking for and it's what they want from you. And if that's what your customers want and they're happy with the experience, it's going to drive the larger company metrics that really matter. It's going to help you with your growth, with your retention, with your profit margins. All of these things matter in the big picture, but it all starts with what your customers actually want from you, which is the most important job. Understand your customers. It makes sense. It's so basic. We all tend to have that focus, but it's how we get there and yeah. how we're looking at the trends, how we're using AI and technologies to get there and adapt new ways of finding ways to serve the customer. The bottom line I'm taking away from everything you've been saying if others had additional follow-up questions and wanted to get a hold of you, would it be appropriate if we gave out maybe a link to your LinkedIn profile? Yeah, absolutely. Candace, thank you so much for taking your time out and sharing all of this with us. This is the way that everyone has valuable insights they can share. And if the community is sharing amongst itself, the rising tide lifts all boats. So we just really appreciate what you're doing here at Forest today. Absolutely. Thank you for the conversation, Steve.